Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Mismatch repair deficiency is something that I do test on most of the patients. We know that in stage two patients, mismatch repair is a, deficiency is actually a predictive marker as well as prognostic marker. So if you have a patient with stage two disease, we test for them to see if they benefit from the chemotherapy 5-FU. So in stage two patients, we definitely test for them. In stage four patients, we also test them for as well because right now, based on some of the data presented at ASCO last year, that mismatch repair deficiency can be a predictive marker to checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy drugs. Therefore, currently there are many trials ongoing right now with a phase one or phase three studies going on looking at colon cancer with mismatch repair deficiency that could potentially get this drug. So even in stage four patients, I do test for them. Now, predictive value of mismatch repair deficiency in stage four is unclear. Now, the, the complicated part is stage three patients. In stage three patients, the prognostic value of mismatch repair is mixed. There's some data that supports that it is a prognostic marker, but then last year, the data presented with a PTOC study tells us that MMR may not be a prognostic marker in stage three patients. Also, in stage three patients, typical adjuvant chemotherapy that we give is full FOX therapy. And there's data from the French study, NSABP CO7, CO8 study, that tell, tells us that the benefit of oxaloplatin is independent of of a mismatch repair status. Therefore, I think in stage three patients, I feel comfortable giving full FOX therapy as an adjuvant therapy in patients who are mismatch repair deficient. Having said that, if you're planning to give just a 5 fee alone in stage three patient, I would still test for mismatch repair. And if they're mismatch repair deficient, I probably would not offer them 5 fee alone because of lack of response that we've seen in stage two patients. You use PCR for MSI and you use IHC to look for deficient mismatch repair, 95% of the time it's the same thing. And, uh, and the reality is are you testing for use in selecting for adjuvant therapy or are, you, or are you looking for people with Lynch syndrome? So my answer always is go to the expert. So one of the things that one of my jobs uh, is to be the uh, the uh, editor-in-chief of ASCO University, which is the online continuing education program for ASCO. And we now have something called the Molecular Oncology Tumor Board. And the reason we did this is that many people don't know what to order, and then they don't know what to do with the results of the, of the studies that they get back. Now many companies, uh, and I won't name them, but many companies will send back a report that you can actually read and understand where the data are interpreted. Uh, but many do not, and so doctors don't know what to order, then they don't know what to do with the answers that they, they finally get. So for MSI testing, the methodology is not so important. It, the, what's important, is, whether it's PCR or IHC, what's important is whether you're looking to screen a patient for Lynch syndrome uh, by testing their tumors, or whether you're using it to uh, predict or prognose in stage two colon cancer. Um, for genomic health, Oncotype DX and a number of other coloprint and a number of other um, uh, predictive assays, they use the word predictive somewhat misleadingly. They predict recurrence pretty well, but that's really prognosis. It's not predicting the outcome of treatment for recurrence. Uh, so when, for example, with Oncotype DX, if MSI is performed by their technology and they use PCR, um, if the MSI is high, they don't go on to do the recurrence score because these stage two patients have such good outcomes that chemotherapy is not likely to be effective. It's also done based on data from the NSABP CO7 trial for patients with early stage three disease, 3A or 3B disease, to see whether or not these people can be, might be better treated with single agent 5-FU th therapy or with oxaliplatin. There are no studies to show that when you do recurrent score, then randomize patients based on the score to different treatments, that you get better outcomes or different outcomes. 
Uh, in fact, for recurrent scores, when the Mayo Clinic group did their study in stage two disease, what they found was about 45% of the time when doctors made a decision about whether they were going to treat with adjuvant therapy and were then given the recurrent score, 45% of the time they changed their minds about treatment. So that, that's an important factor. They changed their minds. It didn't say what happened to the patients um, with, when that change was made. Uh, but what was interesting about it, is it I, I, th I think what interested me the most is, is what did people decide to do? And more often than not, they decided not to use adjuvant therapy. So the cost of the test in that case was much less than the cost of chemotherapy, especially if they were going to use oxaliplatin. So they both not only didn't use treatment at all, or they decided not to use oxaliplatin in patients that they otherwise would have considered high risk. So I think the technology for how MSI or DMMR is done is not so important for a doc as for the doc to talk to the pathologist and tell them what they're looking for and why they want to use it. MSI status is very important in uh, stage two disease. We know that we, bake, we base our adjuvant treatment decision based on MSI status in stage two disease. So if you have MSI high or mismatch with paired deficient in stage two A disease, we typically do not offer patient adjuvant chemotherapy, go with observation. So that's a very well-known fact and every uh, community oncologist should follow that. Having said that, in stage four disease is an area where it's a work in progress. We do test for patients with MS, MSI status in stage four disease to put the patient on a clinical trial, knowing that there's a lot of data telling us that immune checkpoint inhibitors work on patients with MSI high status or mismatch with per deficient patient. Therefore, I think it is still important in a patient with stage four disease where you're giving the patients other cytotoxic or biologic chemotherapy to know the MSI status Knowing that if the patient is MSA high or mismatch with repair deficient, you could offer a patient a trial that uses checkpoint inhibitor. For a long time, we've known that microsatellite unstable or MSI high tumors are a different subset of colon cancer, principally that they have patients with MSI high colon cancer have a better survival. And moreover, it's been part of the paradigm of making decisions on adjuvant therapy such that with stage two colon cancer, if you have an MSI high tumor, you might be less likely to give any adjuvant therapy. More recently, and in a really exciting manner, what we've learned is that when microsatellite instability or MSI high occurs in metastatic patients, that predicts response to PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies, so-called immunotherapy. Now, admittedly, the prevalence of MSI high tumors in stage four is low. It may only be about 4% of patients with metastatic disease having that subset of MSI high. But it's very clear that those are the patients that are responding to these really important drugs. And we learned from a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine reported out in 2015 that we're seeing response rates in the range of 60% with a PD-1 antibody administered to a patient with an MSI high colon cancer. That's a really exciting result. So as, as a consequence, we know we should be getting MSI high testing or MSI testing on all patients. If you have stage four disease and you have an MSI high tumor, you should get into one of these studies, and there are many of them now, looking at a PD-1 or PD-L1 antibody. Now the one question you might ask, what do you do if you find an MSI high patient, stage four, and you don't have a trial, you don't have access to one, should you give one of these antibodies that are now approved to a patient outside of a clinical trial? And I have seen that happen. I've seen people give compassionate use pembrolizumab or nivolumab, both of which are approved, to patients outside of a clinical trial with an MSI high patient. Now, I think they've probably gone to the payer and gotten approval and you need to do that. But, you know, it's an interesting area, and the results are exciting. We need more studies, but what we've seen so far is really compelling.